very good afternoon uh thank you very much uh, for the organizers for inviting me am i audible at the back okay uh sorry i am in between you and uh, your lunch and uh, so let me try to finish uh, a few minutes early if possible uh so i will be talking about a uh, little bit about uh, exploring uh, quantum physics uh, using spin ensemble uh, by using nmr and uh, basically i'll be talking about uh, two uh, topics one is uh, these are the two uh, recent work uh, one is nmr demonstration of quantum pigeon hole effect uh, this was carried by my phd students anjusha and swati hegde and secondly uh, discriminating between luders and pondimon measurement uh, devices uh, which was carried out by sudhir kumar and abhishek shukla both are phd students <coughs> abhishek shukla has just finished uh, phd and currently he is uh, a post doc uh, so uh, little bit of introduction uh, so imagine a molecule like this it's a chloroform it has hydrogen carbon and uh, uh, three chlorines and we talk about uh, the spin the nuclear spin the spin inside uh, the nucleus inside this hydrogen atom and uh, that is proton and uh, so as we know it is a spin half particle and we call that as uh, a qubit often in quantum information language or uh, if you place it in a magnetic field if you place this mag uh, molecule in a magnetic field then it is a two level system the spin can be parallel to the field or anti parallel to the field and uh, accordingly there are two energy levels with an energy gap and if the field is of the order of 10 to 20 tesla then the energy gap happens to be uh, h nu where nu is uh, of the order of uh, like 0.5 gigahertz to 1 gigahertz which is the radio wave range, uh, range. and so what it suggests is uh, that uh, if we take the molecule and keep it in the field this order and then if we irradiate the uh, molecule with this uh, range of uh, radio frequency then we get uh, uh, the resonant absorption so then we get so called rabi oscillations and we can control the spin dynamics we can create superposition we can uh, manipulate the uh, spin state uh, so that's the uh, that's what gives us control so we say uh, we have unitary control on the spin uh, but we don't have one molecule we have like 10 for 15 molecules happily tumbling around and moving around in a liquid uh, this is a liquid state nmr we can also talk about liquid crystal nmr or single crystal nmr where we have different types of molecules now uh, so they are all uh, uh, let us say uh, let us consider liquid uh, state nmr where we we have liquids liquid molecules and uh, they are all in the room temperature but spins live in their own space they, they don't have to move they don't have to tumble i mean so they are all aligned uh, either parallel or anti parallel so they don't care much about the molecular motion of course uh, molecular motion in, introduces its own effects but it doesn't mean that spins are also randomly tumbling so now uh, so we have a huge static field of this order and we have a pair of coils uh, on either side of the sample tube and uh, they produce these uh, radio frequency uh, fields and now what happens uh, now we have magnetization so since we have strong magnetic field along the vertical direction let us call z direction and so we have magnetization huge magnetization uh, parallel to the z axis now by applying the radio frequency field i can Uh, cause rabi oscillation or i can call uh, it's called nutation in nmr language and i can bring the magnetization to xy plane now the normal frequency is always there so which says that uh, the spins have to process about the magnetic field and if you bring the magnetization to xy plane that horizontal plane uh, it doesn't stay there it has to process and it keeps on processing uh, in this uh, uh, plane now you can imagine that it is you have pair of coils and a magnet uh, spinning uh, in between so it is like a dynamo so we call this as nuclear magnetic dynamo and what it produces uh, like a dynamo uh, it produces emf 
and that EMF is what you detect as NMR signal. <coughs> so uh, this is the basic principle of NMR. Uh, so you have uh, magnetization produced by the main field and then you apply the radio frequency field, uh, you tilt the magnetization away from the vertical direction and that produces EMF and you detect the signal as uh, the NMR signal and based on the signal you can calculate uh, expectation values of the transverse components. So you can calculate expectation value of sigma x or sigma y or both of them in a quadrature detected signal and then Fourier transform it okay, and then you get this kind of signal. So you get Lorentzian uh, absorptive or dispersive peaks. Now, uh, so now we can talk about tomography because now we know the, uh, we know that we can uh, calculate certain expectation values. Then uh, question is whether we can build the complete density matrix. And uh, so here is uh, how it goes. So uh, an arbitrary density matrix can be expressed in terms of an identity part and uh, then in terms of Pauli operators. Uh, arbitrary direction, these are nx, ny, nz are uh, components of a unit vector, a sigma x, sigma y, sigma z are Pauli matrices and then we have a purity factor sitting here which is very rather small in NMR, it is of the order of 10 power minus 5. Now in NMR, uh, so what we basically detect is uh, these uh, components nx, ny, nz and we uh, generally don't care much about the purity because it is anyway small. And we ignore the background also because it remains the same throughout the experiment. It doesn't change anyway. So we just ignore the background. And uh, if we uh, determine nx, ny, nz, then we say it is a uh, like tomography of the uh, density matrix. So we say it is the tomography of the traceless part of the density matrix. Now, uh, so how many experiments do we need? Uh, so nx and ny, as I said, it's a, in a quadrature detected uh, NMR signal, it can be detected in one experiment and you need second experiment for uh, determining NZ because now you can bring NZ into XY plane and then uh, you can measure what is NZ. So you need, uh, uh, you need about uh, two experiments uh, to completely determine the density matrix. Now we can talk about two qubits. So you have two nuclear spins instead of one nuclear spin. Uh, so now density matrix is larger. So we have 4 by 4 matrix now, 2 power 2 by 2 power 2 and now we have more elements to detect. Uh, so you can use uh, the property of the, okay, so this is, I am talking about uh, density matrices. So they are Hermitian, trace 1 and so on. Now how many unknowns are there? There are only 15 real unknowns uh, because of the Hermit uh, hermeticity and trace 1 property. Uh, so in one experiment, uh, in one NMR experiment, you can't detect all of them. What you can detect? Uh, are these elements the, uh, the, uh, having green colors. So those are the transverse X and Y magnetizations. So those are the only terms which you can detect, read directly from the NMR coils. Now, uh, so that gives us, uh, direct measurement gives us eight linear equations, but there are 15 real unknowns. So that means that you have to apply certain unitaries, noun unitaries, so that you can apply. Uh, these are precisely, uh, optimized unitaries and then what it does basically is uh, it sort of mixes of uh, all other white elements into these green elements and green elements are already read out so we know what are those green elements and uh, in the second experiment the white elements are mixed up with the green and again direct measurement uh, reveals these green boxes and uh, you get uh, eight additional linear equations because this u is norm. So now uh, you have 16 linear equations and 15 unknowns. So just by two experiments, uh, you can measure the complete density matrix. And that is how uh, we do tomography of the two qubit uh, density matrix. Now I'll be using some of these notions as I go along. <coughs> now what about n qubits? So it, uh, things will really get uh, complicated. Uh, so you have, we have to measure uh, many, many experiments. We have to take out uh, various unitaries, noun unitaries and uh, it's almost like uh, these eight people uh, trying to find out what is an elephant. So you recover all the uh, information and then you solve the equations and then you have to find out what is the density matrix. Uh, so once you know the density matrix, then uh, suppose uh, uh, now we have to find out what is the uh, distance between the expected density matrix and uh, 
the density matrix what you have measured. Uh, so we have this standard formula, uh, sometimes called as correlation, sometimes called as fidelity between the density matrix. You can use, okay, there are various measures of fidelity. So this is one of the measures of, uh, one of the definitions of fidelity in density matrix is this. You take the trace distance and uh, uh, divide it by the normalized, uh, normalization constant. <coughs> Uh, so uh, this can be done, and uh, then we can say what is we can talk about what is the fidelity of the experiment, whether an experiment is uh, poor because uh, the controls are not good, or experiment is poor uh, uh, because tomography is not good, or whether the uh, that is the expected state, and so on. Now a little bit about post selection. Uh, so we we can also do post selection. Uh, uh, we have heard about post selection. Uh, many times today. Uh, for example, if we have hydrogen here and uh, next to that we have carbon 13, carbon 12 is uh, spin 0, uh, which is 99 percent abundant around us, uh, whereas 1 percent of the carbon around us is carbon 13, which has one extra neutron, so it is spin half. Uh, so let's call this as a system we want to study that and uh, this is called as ancillary qubit or shortly ancilla. And both are spin half now. So now, uh, what happens if you measure ancilla uh, qubit? So I don't measure, uh, system is already in some state. I want to see what is the state of the, uh, I want to see whether system is in zero or is system is in one. And this information is obtained by measuring ancilla. So if I measure carbon, it will tell whether uh, the proton that is close to that is uh, parallel or anti-parallel. So uh, I get two separate signals. They are, uh, they are shifted by some frequencies. So this frequency gap uh, uh, is the line separation is exactly equal to the coupling between these two spins, spin spin interactions. Uh, so one peak corresponds to uh, the, the system qubit being in state 0, and the other peak corresponds to the system qubit being in state 1. So if this disappears, I can say that system is uh, completely in 1, and uh, if this disappears, I can say system is in 0. So just by looking at the ancillary qubit, I can talk about what is the state of the uh, system. Now, if I ignore uh, system being in one and uh, analyze only this, that is like post selection. So I'm doing post selection. So let me give some examples uh, as I go along. So let's first talk about the pigeonhole effect. Uh, so pigeonhole principle is a old principle. It is uh, it has a lot of applications in uh, classical computation theory. So what it says is, so if you put three pigeons in two pigeon holes, at least two of the pigeons end up in the same hole, which is very quite obvious thing. Such a simple obvious thing uh, seems to be violated in the quantum case. And this was uh, pointed out by Arnau and uh, co-workers uh, last year. <coughs> So they published this paper saying uh, quantum violation of the pigeonhole principle and the nature of the quantum correlations. And they say that uh, we find instant instances when three quantum uh, particles are put in two boxes and no two particles are in the same box. Uh, so there are situations where we, we find such uh, uh, very counterintuitive uh, cases. So let me uh, describe it a uh, little bit more detail, but uh, before that, so this is what they say in their paper. We show that uh, quantum mechanics violates one of the found fundamental principles of nature. If you put three particles in two boxes, necessarily two particles will end up in the same box. We find instances when three quantum particles are put in two boxes, yet no two particles are in the same box, a seemingly impossible and absurd effect. This is only one of the, one of a host of uh, related quantum effects which we discovered and which point to a very interesting structure of quantum mechanics. It was hitherto unnoticed and had major implications uh, for our understanding of nature. It requires us to revisit some of the most basic notations of quantum physics, the notions of separability, correlations and interactions. Uh, okay, so the uh, quantum pigeonhole effect can be very nicely demonstrated. Uh, this is the diagram from their paper. Uh, by using uh, a simple Max Zender interferometer. So this is the Max Zender interferometer and we have a beam splitter here, two mirrors here and here. 
and a phase shifter here, 90 degree phase shifter, and the second beam splitter here. So there are two beam splitters, two mirrors, and a phase shifter, and two detectors. Now let us consider uh, uh, the labeling here. So I label this uh, half as left half and this half as the right half. If a photon goes there, I label it as ket L, and if a photon goes there, I label it as ket R. And to begin with, so let us say we have LLL. All the three uh, particles can be photons or electrons or whatever. All the three particles are on the left side. And they are uh, incident on this beam splitter and beam splitter splits them equally uh, into left and right. Now uh, the state can be expressed as plus 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 where plus is equal superposition of left and right. Now, the effect of uh, phase shifter can be uh, understood this way. So I, it takes plus two plus i, so ket plus two, uh, ket plus i, where it is L plus i times r. So we have 90 degree phase shift. L plus r goes to L plus i r. Or it, you can rotate other way, it can be like L minus i r. So it depends on what kind of phase shifter you can use. Uh, so now you have, uh, after this beam splitter, you have plus, 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 and uh, these uh, mirrors guide them towards this beam splitter. On the way, you have this phase shifter. And then you have two detectors. Now, the force selection. Now, the force selection is such that you detect, uh, you consider only the particles that enter the detector D1. So that's the force selection. So all the three particles must enter detector D1. So that's the force selection. So consider the cases uh, when all the three particles enter the detector D1. Now you can talk about uh, uh, what are the possibilities, possible paths. So for that, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the projectors. So I can say that first two particles, particle one and two are both in the left side. So then I can set up the projector LL uh, one, two, uh, outer product LL. So that is the projector for uh, two, one, one and two particles being in the left side. Similarly, I can set up other projectors, LR, RR, RN, and so on. Now, what is the uh, projector for one and two being in the same arm? That is LL plus RR, that's for one and two. So that is the projector for one and two being in the same arm. Similarly, uh, we can talk about one and two being in the different arm. Now this is what uh, Arno uh, and co-workers uh, have shown, that if you talk about the state phi, plus i, plus i, plus i, after this phase shifter, uh, sorry, before this phase shifter, and then it turns out uh, that expectation value of uh, this projector, uh, in this, that one and two particles being in the same arm, is zero. So this is what they have shown. Now what it means is, you see, uh, the way it can, uh, uh, the way all the three particles can enter this detector is when uh, all the three particles are plus 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 here, because then uh, Adamard makes it makes them uh, again LLL. So they all enter there. But then for that it has to be plus i plus i plus i because uh, phase shifter makes them plus plus plus. So that's how they enter there, but then uh, that happens to be zero. Now, so what it says is that uh, uh, one and two particles cannot be in the same path. They can, one and two cannot be here, neither be here. But then the problem is uh, the state is symmetric under one, two, two, three, and one, three. It is not biased to any, in uh, one, two in any way. So if it applies for one, two, it is also applies for uh, two, three, and one. So as you can see, uh, so this immediately says that uh, no two particles uh, can be in the same path. Now, so that's the uh, uh, counterintuitive part. So we have three particles and two paths, left or right, but no two particles can be in the same path, provided you have this force selection, that all the three particles enter this detector. 
so now we can talk about uh, uh, some experimental uh, uh, thought experiment. So they talked about uh, this uh, possible experiment. Imagine that uh, there are three electrons, so they all repel with, uh, repel each other. Uh, so now all the three particles, all the three electrons are uh, uh, starting from LLL and they are split by this beam splitter into left and right. Now if any two electrons are in the same path, they must be repelled, right? And uh, so if two electrons are repelled, then they must, uh, uh, suppose if one and two are in the same path, they must be repelled and they should go away. If there is no repulsion, then we should get this uniform pattern. If you start with triangular pattern, you should get the uh, same triangular pattern. But if there is a repulsion between one and two, we should get this. So this means that one and two have traveled in the same path. But if you have two and three in the same path, then we should get this repulsion between uh, two and three, similarly one and three. And if all three are repelled, then we should get uh, this one, two, three. And then they uh, sort of uh, uh, naively, they uh, uh, give the picture of uh, what is the combined effect of this, 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 and that's what the combined effect. So there should be some distortion in the pattern because of the repulsion, uh, just because of the fact that uh, multiple electrons are taking the same path. But then they calculated and show that this will never happen. So even though electrons uh, repel each other, they showed that uh, we get undistorted uh, pattern. So this is uh, a thought experiment. It is uh, not the experiment which is, it is not the experimental result. So this, the, uh, this is something one can go and uh, test it out. So this is what is predicted uh, from the quantum mechanics. <clears throat> that uh, even though for this course selection that uh, all the three electrons enter the same detector, there will be undistorted pattern at the end of the uh, Alexander interval. So they say naively one would expect to see the three beams deflected outwards and deformed. Each electron should move radially outward when uh, all three are present in the same arm and sideways uh, when only two electrons are present. We expect the deviation to be uh, by less than the cross section, but nevertheless by a noticeable amount. Instead, what we find is that the beams are completely undeflected, undisturbed, indicating that there was no interaction whatsoever between the electrons. <coughs> so, electrons, uh, no two electrons are in the same. Now, we wanted to uh, demonstrate this uh, using uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So, we took this uh, uh, system which has uh, four uh, spins like hydrogen, fluorine, fluorine, fluorine. So one hydrogen and three fluorines. Fluorines, by the way, are also spin half. Bromine doesn't take part uh, into uh, this uh, experiment because it is spin zero here. Oxygens also don't take part. Carbons don't take part. So only uh, spins that we have are, are one hydrogen and three fluorines. Now, for us, these three fluorines are the uh, three pigeons, we can say three particles. And we have one hydrogen, uh, which is the ancillary cubic. So that is uh, handy for force selection, as we'll see. Uh, so we have a very nice uh, Hamiltonian for uh, in this. So all the off-diagonal elements are the spin-spin interactions. The strength of the spin-spin interaction is in hertz. And the diagonal elements uh, are uh, the chemical shifts, so-called chemical shifts, which are the resonance frequency differences. Now here is the Maxander interferometer converted into quantum information language. A beam splitter is a Hadamard operator, uh, which can be applied uh, by carefully calibrating the radio frequency pulse. So what it, all it does is, uh, it takes a qubit and prepares uh, uniform superposition. It tilts it by 90 degree pulse and prepares uniform superpositions of up and down, uh, parallel and anti-parallel to the magnet. So that's the Hadamard, so that's the beam splitter. So we have three, uh, <laughs> Beam splitter on all the pigeons, so that is the first part of the Maxander interferometer. And similarly, the last part of the Maxander interferometer is the second beam splitter. And we have this phase shifter here, which uh, uh, creates 90 degree phase shift. And now we have to introduce uh, something like repulsion uh, in their experiment. So that was used for detecting uh, whether two electrons are in the same path or not. So we didn't want to do that way. We wanted to do in a slightly different way. So we wanted to use Ancilla here, which gives a, a non-invasive measurement of the state of these fluorines. 
So what we do is uh, certain gates. So what it happens if i and j are in the same, uh, if i th uh, uh, particle and j th particle are in the same uh, state, then uh, hydrogen is flipped here. Uh, so I, hydrogen is not flipped. If i is not equal to j, if the states of uh, any two fluorines are not same, then hydrogen is flipped. For example, if F1 and F2 um, both are up, okay, that means they are in the same path, then nothing is happening on the hydrogen. Whereas F1 is in the uh, up direction, F2 is in the down direction, that means they are in the different arms of the Alexander interpolator. In that case, uh, hydrogen is flipped. No, no, it's not just control membrane. It's different. It's not control membrane. It, okay, I have the. It is like uh, this is like that. This plus this. This is this. Okay. So now, if this uh, if this projector is uh, uh, satisfied, okay, then we uh, don't do anything on the hydrogen. Okay. So this is like this tensor product ident identity plus this tensor product sigma x. So that's the that's the unitary operator. Yes. 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 So this is uh, like this plus open circles of these. So open circle flips when they are zero. So this plus uh, another. So that's why we have written in a box there. So this means uh, if these two are in the same state, then you uh, don't do anything. If these two are in the different thing, then you flip it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, but you, action is on the hydrogen. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. This is the experimental result. Now in the thermal equilibrium, we have uh, eight uh, transitions for hydrogen, and these correspond to different possible states of the uh, three fluorines. Three fluorines each have uh, two levels, so it is like two power three. So there are eight possible uh, states of three fluorines and uh, so it can be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 or till 1, 1, 1. So these are the, uh, okay, this is the cartoon and this is the uh, actual spectrum. <coughs> now we, okay, thermal equilibrium has all, kind, all kinds of uh, things. It has background and it's noisy and so on. Now we prepare a special state that is 0, 0, 0. It is like LLL in the Alexander interferometer. You start all, of, all the three particles uh, starting from the same path. So now we prepare them in 0, 0, 0 state. Uh, and then you apply Hadamard. Hadamard is not so perfect in this experiment. So uh, ideally we should ex expect the same equal intensities. It is now superposition plus, plus, plus. Now you apply this uh, U12 and then ask the question whether the hydrogen is uh, flipped or not. If the hydrogen is flipped, that means 1 and 2 are not in the same state. Because uh, if you see our, uh, if you recall the table, if I and J are equal, then hydrogen is not flipped. If hydrogen is flipped, then uh, I and J are not same. Now again post selection, so this, uh, the first transition is 0, 0, 0. And last transition is 1, 1, 1. Now, if you look at this, uh, and if you post select this transition, that means all the three detectors entering, all the three particles entering the same detector, and you can see that negative line. So, this says that uh, uh, the question is 1 and 2 in the same state uh, for post selection D0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Answer is no. So, that's the experimental signal. So, it says 1 and 2 are not in the same state. And then you can repeat the experiment and apply these. And then, uh, so that is like asking the question, 1 and 3 are in the same state. Again, you get uh, flipped here. Answer is no. And 2 and 3 are in the same state. Again, answer is no. So this is uh, another way of uh, testing pigeonhole effect with uh, post selection. Uh, so this is the. Uh, result and uh, in the manuscript we have analyzed a little bit more. Um, we have considered other possibilities and all. Uh, I, I won't be going into all those details. 
I won't be going into the technical details of the MRI scan and so on. Uh, so I just want to say that uh, this quantum pigeonhole effect uh, is uh, another instance of uh, quantum physics defying classical notions and uh, they have generalized it to n particles in m box and log basis. So I talked about only three particles in two boxes. Uh, expected to have important implications in our understanding uh, of quantum mechanics. So that's one part. <coughs> Now the second part, I quickly move on. So it's about uh, discriminating uh, between von Neumann and uh, Luders measurement. Okay, so uh, before I go into these things, let me give some, uh, before I go into discrimination of these things, uh, let me just give the introduction. Uh, so let, let's say we have a quantum system in state rho and uh, we have a, a non-degenerate observable A. So all eigenvalues are different and then we make measurement and then uh, the measurement rule, measurement postulate in quantum mechanics says that, uh, okay, when I say measurement, I, am, I mean strong measurement, uh, says that wave function collapses to an eigenstate, the wave, uh, the state collapses to an eigenstate and node, okay, so this is uh, where Luder and von Neumann both agree, so there is no problem and outcome is an eigenvalue observable k n. However, if we have a degenerate observable, then there is a difference. There are two update rules. In fact, uh, historically von Neumann collapse uh, uh, postulate came first historically. So he came up with this idea that uh, probably there will be degeneracy breaking uh, even if there are degeneracies in the uh, eigen, uh, degeneracy in the observable and the state is prepared in a uh, degenerate subspace of this uh, observable. So uh, according to von Neumann collapse, degeneracy is broken. That means uh, even if you have superposition, superposition, uh, the system should collapse out of the superposition, it should collapse to uh, some state which is not the superposition. So superposition is not prepared, uh, preserved. So that is the historically uh, uh, which uh, uh, predates this Luders collapse. Again, the, uh, as far as the measurement outcome is concerned, it is same. Now, this uh, notion was uh, uh, updated later. Uh, it was uh, corrected uh, rather that uh, people found that it is not uh, true that uh, degeneracy is not broken and ex there were experimental evidences for that. And uh, then Luders corrected it and said uh, the measurement should respect the degeneracy and superposition is pre uh, preserved if the state of the system is in the degenerate subspace of the uh, measurement observable, then superposition is preserved. And this is what we, uh, we all study in the next today. Now the notion is, uh, uh, this was uh, Sorry. Uh, now, uh, a few years ago, Hagerfeld and uh, Sala Mayato, they actually visualized that um, maybe it is possible to realize or envisage a uh, von Neumann type of uh, uh, measurement device where a degeneracy is broken. Their idea was like this. Suppose we have a degenerate uh, uh, observable A, which has uh, two positive uh, plus one eigenvalues and two uh, minus one eigenvalues, it's a degenerate observable. But uh, so they said maybe the system actually instead of measuring A, it measures some other operator, it is they called as system observable. Instead of measuring A, it measures A prime, which is compatible with A, it commutes with A and which has some functional relationship with A. So internally the system, the measurement device, the measurement device uh, somehow measures A prime. This is how they reformulated this uh, von Neumann's measurement. And then, uh, so measurement takes place and uh, if you see the post measurement state, uh, then you will see that uh, degeneracy is, uh, as far as this is concerned, it is broken. Uh, that means uh, the superposition is uh, also collapsed. 
and it comes out of uh, uh, the superposition. So the output state is not same as the input state because we have prepared the state in the superposition state. And uh, so it appears as if it is von Neumann, uh, von Neumann measurement. Whereas in the standard case, uh, A and A prime are same. They have same degenerate uh, subspaces. This is what we uh, usually see and then that is the Luders uh, update. Uh, so, but then they said in order to test this, uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, sometimes it is possible that uh, you, it appears Luders, but if you change the uh, initial state, maybe it, and then again as this question, you repeat many times for different states, maybe you get von Neumann for some states. Now that's their uh, idea. Now, <clears throat> so we can uh, test it out. Uh, so they also gave the protocol how to test it out and so on. So we, I just give one example of that. Suppose we uh, choose the computational uh, basis as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then choose the same observable, which is the degenerate. It has two plus one eigenvalues and two minus one eigenvalues. And then I can uh, write down the system observable, which is compatible to this. Uh, and which has the functional relationship with this uh, A. Uh, in this case, I choose uh, A prime uh, as an example. I can, there are, it's not unique, uh, but I, as an example, I choose A prime to be this. Uh, as you can see, all the eigenvalues are different. So it is a non-degenerate uh, observable. And it has functional relationship with A. Now question is, uh, now you try to measure this uh, operator A and then uh, uh, ask the question whether uh, you get uh, what is expected from A prime or what is expected from A, uh, if it is uh, Luder like or if it is. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> so here is the experiment. In NMR, we don't have the luxury of the strong projective measurement. So we again use ancilla. Uh, so we entangle the system with an ancilla. Uh, so that is, that acts like a measurement device because measurement device always entangles with the system to be studied or uh, the uh, state which has to be studied. And then uh, it, the pointer collapses to one state. And, uh, but then we have to uh, switch to pointer basis because uh, here is what we do. Uh, we make strong projections along the uh, field, in the main field, uh, whether it is up or down. So that's why we apply this uh, switching to pointer basis uh, to switch the state to uh, Z uh, along the direction of the field. And then we do uh, the tomography, the quantum state tomography that I briefly mentioned uh, before. So this is the, I don't again uh, go into the technical aspect of NMR experiment. So we can entangle by using uh, uh, some unitaries. These unitaries can be carefully designed uh, by using optimal quantum controls. And uh, so this is the unitary which is uh, uh, for used for switching to pointer basis. And then uh, ask the question, what is the theoretically expected uh, final state, post measurement state? If it is von Neumann, it turns out that uh, it actually destroys all those, uh, although you start with superposition state, as you can see, you started with superposition plus, 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 plus. But uh, if you do, if it is really von Neumann state, it destroys the superposition. So there will not be any off diagonal element in the density matrix. You are left with only maximally mixed state. So only diagonal elements. But if it is Luders, it, uh, it is, uh, it respects the degeneracy and uh, there will be off diagonal elements. And this is what you expect. And uh, so we can do this experiment using uh, uh, two system qubits and two ancilla qubits as I described earlier. And uh, so we choose uh, this molecule with a very nice uh, interaction uh, Hamiltonian. And this is what we found. Uh, so if it is uh, von Neumann, we should expect maximally mixed uh, output. If it is Luders, we get this. As you can, okay, so this is how it, this uh, uh, bar diagram looks like. This is uh, identity tensor product sigma x. And this is how the experiment looks like. Uh, so, uh, uh, as, as we uh, already expected that uh, the most of the measurement devices respect uh, Luder's postulate, Luder's measurement postulate. So we also see uh, that uh, uh, this particular experiment also favors Luder's postulate. 
the idea is uh, not just to prove the Luders postulate, it is all uh, well expected, but uh, the idea is to be able to discriminate if there is a von Neumann uh, measurement to be able to discriminate uh, from the Luders measurement results. Uh, so, uh, HM protocol can be used to discriminate uh, between uh, von Neumann and the Luders measurement. In principle, von Neumann device may exist. Uh, it might be possible to convert Luders divide into von Neumann or something in between. That is more interesting because that's what uh, they say in the Kerry paper. Uh, that it is, you can realize something, uh, neither von Neumann nor uh, Luders, but some, somewhere in between. Thank you. Pigeonhole experiment, we've been thinking about similar things in, in my lab, but I wanted to ask one question. Did you only do the strong measurement case, or did you also change the state of the ancilla to weak measurements? Uh, no, we don't do weak measurements because uh, it is a non-invasive measurement anyway. The reason is the measurement of the ancilla takes place at the end of the uh, Alexander interferometer. So the, actually the result of the state of uh, the fluorine states are sort of encoded in hydrogen, but it is not measured until the end of the Maxander interrupter. So here we do the strong measure. But if, if you prepared the hydrogen in yes. a different state, yes. uh, if you did a rotation on the hydrogen before yes. the unitary, yes. it seems to me you could implement an arbitrarily weak measurement. Yeah, you, um, perhaps, yes, but we didn't do that case. <laughs> In the second last slide, uh, I mean, uh, second last slide, uh, where you showed some, I mean, slow. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shall we put that? Oh. Uh, so, here, uh, what are the axes? Okay. So, uh, so the axis, yes. uh, these are the, uh, this is actually density matrix, okay. So you can consider one side as ket and another side as bra because density matrix is just outer product of these two things, right. And uh, so the z axis is the, uh, the number, size of the number in the, uh, size of the element of the density matrix. And as I said, the tra uh, this is trace zero because trace is not measured in NMR exponent. And I mean, uh, so in experiment you get, I mean, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, in experiment you got uh, matching both with uh, von Neumann and Luders. No, we don't get uh, this, we don't get uh, maximally mixed state. Oh. No, but uh, this thing is uh, the left one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this. So this, uh, if it is true, if it is von Neumann, we shouldn't get uh, signal at all because maximally mixed state has no coherence. Uh, so it has no signal doesn't lead to any NMR signal. Uh, but we do get yeah. strong signal. Yes, uh, not only we get signal, but also matches with what Luder says. But this is imaginary part, sorry. <laughs> okay, this is a real part and imaginary part of the density matrix. questions? Uh, the timing of the ancillary measurement in the case of a non busy measurement, does that change anything? So, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, if I perform the ancillary measurement before, yes. does it change in experiment? Yes, it might change because they are entangled at that point. Uh, hydrogen and fluorines are entangled, and if you measure hydrogen, it will disturb fluorines. I mean, do you have any experimental uh, signature, like if I me measure the ancillary before? Yes, uh, it will change.
Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At the same time, um, yeah, maybe I, so I can do one thing. I can put uh, one trivial way. I mean, uh, brute force may, may maybe take three hydrogens and uh, put all three and uh, put send the effect on different hydrogens. Uh, so that is one way. Uh, we haven't done that. Yes, uh, that's uh, that's a good thing. Good point. 